are, yeah, the Sumo deadlift is an interesting one for me because, you know, obviously I haven't pulled Sumo specifically, but I think the principles of it, you know, I think we really evolved the way we coach it in the past year, and especially when we think more of the like, applying the Lindmark model and stuff. You know, we talk about, about that pronation or mid stance or, you know, squishing the foot. But, you know, I really want to know how you kind of talk about the sumo deadlift to your lifters. Because, um, you know, people obviously used to think, okay, this hips out, let's abduct a lot. But, you know, I think it's really evolved in the past year or so. And it's really, well, if you go too much in the ER, you know, we can't really IR, right? So, but, you know, <clears throat> I, I haven't really had much, you know, most of my lifters right now, pretty much pull conventional. I got like a couple of lifters playing sumo and, you know, mm-hmm. I've definitely improved, um, you know, through using like, like I said, the mark model to kind of like contextualize it for them. But I'm a bit curious yeah. of how you go through your model, technical model of the sumo development. Okay. So I think one of the, th- at least for me, one of the most interesting things in recent times, especially for the sumo deadlift and the modeling of the, of the sumo deadlift, or the idea behind it is actually to start at the foot, right? Because I think that is the main kind of, um, like like we talked about crushing the bug and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's actually the main point in which we are putting force through, right? So I think it's very important to kind of define that if we know that we are going to do a compressive activity, right? Then ideally we want to set up in a position where we are moving into, I guess, like zone two of the arc, right? So if, we, if, we, if we're talking about zone two, then ideally what this looks like is probably um, after, so if, we, if we're talking about sort of like the foot mechanics, right? It is, it is the point in which the big, I would say the, the, the forefoot makes contact with the ground. So if, it's, if you're talking about a gate cycle, right? Your, your early, your kind of like your heel strike would be from the moment your heel hits the ground and then the foot comes down and then the, that forefoot makes contact right and then after that that hit that's kind of like the end of the heel strike phase and the start of the kind of um, compressive kind of mid stance phase right which is where we want to kind of exist when we train right so so we have this full range to move through right we have we have the minute, the, the moment which the forefoot comes down and and the whole range of which the ankle kind of rocks over the, the foot, right? Up to the point in which the heel starts to lift off, right? Yep. So why this is important? Because we want to know that, okay, like we want to know that, okay, so and we've established that two things at the ground needs to happen, right? You need a you need a heel, and you need a forefoot, right? So, and and when we're moving through this compressive range, that is where you get your midfoot, right? So, now that we've established that, I think the important thing is that when you are in a sumo deadlift and you try to open up the hips, right? You you're now kind of trading. I, at least just from a setup perspective, you are trading that that sagittal um, movement of that um, of the ankle throughout that mid stance phase, right? And you are kind of like turning it out, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so when you start to so imagine these are your feet, right? This is a in the conventional, right? It's um like you wouldn't tell someone to pull conventional just by driving through the heels and lifting their toes up, right? Because they, they would have no power and, and you kind of bias them into an earlier heel strike phase, which is just expansion. It's not compression or anything, right? Like obviously these are spectrum things. But the thing I think that people start to lose when they start to open up their stance, right? So imagine if you just kind of open up your stance like this, is they lose the ability to... Um, dorsiflex um, into the bar. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because now your feet is like that, right? Yeah. The only way you can move is <clears throat> over the toes. Yeah. Right. And if yeah. the bar is here, it can't move like this, right? Yeah. Because if you push into the, if you kind of just bring your shins towards the bar, which is what like 
everyone knows they need to do because they need to stay in the bar, right? Then you will lift off your the outside of your foot. Yeah. Right. So 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 that's so that's the first thing, right? So I did so now that um, we have that kind of the arc in mind. I think it's very important that we are trying to make sure that when we look at the foot and the sumo deadlift, right? Um, people talk about like vertical shin angle, vertical shin angle, ver vertical tibia angle, right? A lot. But I think it's actually, it's actually, if you look at it relative and when the movement is initiated, right? If that, if that, um, if that uh, tibia starts to plantar flex, then you start you started expanding, right? And you're not compressing anymore, right? So I think that because you're not compressing anymore, and you can't put force in the ground, then you have to pull. And I think one of the things that I'm seeing a lot of is that when you start to go really heel heavy, and drive through your heels, you create this anti this kind of posterior weight shift, right? And then you see the background, and then you see like everything else happens, right? And then it becomes a pull because you're not, you can't compress into, um, you can't get the compression that you get from dorsiflexion and then you don't have cords and you don't have glutes as a result of that as well. So your prime movers don't, don't, don't move. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, I think one of the things I basically use to like describe it to lifters is like, I, I, I try to get them to feel, <clears throat> feel like a pinball machine because the way for them to get their quads engage or you know get get that max mid stance compression is at the start don't even think about anything else but just drive through the ball to big toe like a pinball machine so we're the way we get that maximum slack pull or maximum compression strategy is we, we drive it down like you're loading 10 20 30 40 and once you reach people yeah. always think the slack pull is like oh i've got to pull my you know i've got to you know like retract and pull but really it's pushing through the ball to big toe to generate that tension Right. as like a pinball machine and max you know max um pronation and then just like i said just stand up because exactly what you said is when people try to pull it rather than just think about you know pushing like a pinball machine and maximally compressing upwards what's going to happen is that posterior weight shift right yeah you know but you know i think one, one of the things i want to talk about is like you know i think um like you said that max that hip abduction is so i'm guessing you coach <clears throat> when you cue lifters in the sumo deadlift is you're talking more about instead of trying to abduct out it's more like well okay your hips have to be a bit externally rotated but when you come towards the bar you're talking about just knees forward while keeping that um compression that zone to the planting through the ground rather than opening out and then as a result like you said your feet's gonna roll over to the side right i'm guessing that's how you coach it through them yeah i think i think one of uh yeah, I think one thing to clarify is that obviously we're talking about the model and stuff, and I don't yeah, yeah. actually actually um like coach it that way because that it would be so pointless, right? We'll, I would need to talk about the the propulsion arc. I would need to talk, but so if we're talking about physically coaching it, I think one of the things that I'm very uh, I I'm quite like um uh, cautious about is tr once their shins, once they've set up, um, they're set up needs to establish the amount of hip abduction, right? So once they've established that, they are not, when their shins touch the bar, they are not externally rotating anymore because external rotation like, or abduction, right? Is, is always an expansion strategy, right? So, so when you're trying to put force in the ground, that's a, that's a systemic, that compression strategy, systemic IR, right? And your hips are actually trying to go through internal rotation, right? And I think that the thing is, when your hips are trying to go through internal rotation, what is happening is um, your knees are actually kind of, if you, if you, if this is your knee, right? And you've externally rotated them, right? And, and you're gonna like extend them, right? Your hips are actually going through this like internal rotation moment, if you look at it like anatomically, right? Um, but you're trying to like use a, I would say, I would think you're trying to use a, um, a glute max and a glute and a glute, actually not even a glute me. I think you're just trying to use a glute max to like open up the hips, right? 
whilst you whilst the adapter is trying to pull the hip in right so then so then it's not only an inefficient um, strategy right because you're trying to expand because you're trying to expand when you're trying to compress right it's actually like a tug of war between a glute max and a and a and an adapter magnus right yeah. and at the same time i also think that um the line of pull of like things like the glute mead probably is not like it's probably not in because your hips will be somewhat flexed right so the line of pull probably makes it into a rotator anyways so it's not going to help you to pull so so now you have all of these forces like acting on your knee or your hip and stuff and people start to complain oh i got groin pain i got i get like you know um hip pain and stuff like that and then you wonder um, and you just look at it and you're like, okay, there's something about that movement that isn't right. Or you and, and you and, and where it does, where they always struggle when they use such a strategy is that lockout because, because they don't have, because they've, they've managed to get the bar moving, right. Just from bringing the hips in, but they don't have like, they've deleveraged themselves from being able to use like a, like, like quads to push into the floor. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I, I think, like you said, everything with like a lockout issue is you just completely come from the starting position. But would, you, but would you say, you know, like in terms of the technical model to sumo, so when we're talking about, like you said, like abducting out too much is just pointless because it's ER, we're going to use the glute max when really it's glute max is just sagittal, we're just locking it out, right? So you would basically, and I think something we're seeing a lot now is, you know, like you said, the toes, instead of it being, you know, like we see used to see this a lot where it's, you know, yeah. like that. But I, I usually think the best sumo deadlifts should just yeah. really be like 15 degree because once again, when you're this far out, you're just yeah. trying to expand way too much. And yeah. that foot's just going to roll out. You can't get any pronation, can't get any force through the quad. So the way I think about it is really, you can have a wider stance, but that foot really needs to come in because otherwise your adductor is just going to, it's not going to feel nice because I realized like uh, a lot of lifters, especially who used to have like a really wide stance and now I've gotten them to feel that internal, you know, actually internally yeah. rotate, push through the quads a lot more. They actually are coming, oh man, my adductor is, can't really take the stress tolerance. And that's when I realized, okay, we've actually got to tone down the intensity because you used to not actually internally rotate at all. You used to just yeah. use your lower back and yeah. ER upwards, you know? Yeah. So, so, so I think, I think that, to, that toe angle thing is also another big, is, is, is another big part of that whole like foot, like propulsive foot kind of idea, right? Because the more you turn out that foot, right? The more you're essentially like inverting the tibia as well, uh, or the, sorry, the calcaneus, right? So, so you've got a heel that like, if you're looking from the back, right? This is your foot you have a heel that's kind of like this now. And, and, and when you need to compress, when you go need to go in a mid foot, your calcaneus, your calcaneus needs to evert, right? It needs to come in, but then you are trying to force it. You're trying to literally put it at a position where it cannot come in because if it comes in, right, you you see this big like knee cave and then you see like, yeah. So, so I think that that degree of toe, that toe angle, um, is actually something that's really important. And like, we can talk about, and I think this is one of the benefits of the, of have, understanding the model a little bit better because, right, you, you, you don't need to, like, you don't need to get into the sort of complexities of it. But when you see something that's not meant to be happening, you just have to identify at which joint um, it's not doing what it's meant to be doing like what kind of rotations is happening. And then you just have to like adjust it slightly, right? Just put it in a different position so that it can go through the rotation that it needs to go through. And then, and then you, it's, it's like a problem solving tool more than anything. I think, I think people complicate, like complicate it too much. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it's just like, like exactly what you said, right? Like the way we should be, you know, using it with clients or, you know, athletes is like, Okay, it's very simple. Force production means internal rotation. All you gotta do is feel your inner quads, adductors, and slam the shit down like you're gonna like a pinball and like crush the butt. 
that that's simply it. And then the, our job is to analyze, okay, something's not right. And exactly what you said, like, let's investigate. Is it happening at the foot? Is it happening at the knees? Is it happening at the pelvis or whatnot? Right. Cause I mean, like you said, they're all inextricably linked, right? Like if it's not following, it's probably something above, you know, proximal to the store or whatever. But yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I think that's really, you know, I think that's what I really like about where health and coaching is, you know, kind of trending nowadays. It's like, we're really, you know, we we're able to analyze things a lot more in depth, even just remote, right? I think before maybe we would feel a lot less confident doing stuff, you know, just remote, but now through the simplicity of the model, we can really, you know, instill cues or changes much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, I think one of the things that, like, I always use um, Yuri as an example, right? But I think one of the things that is really interesting about this is that when you look at a good pool, right, it kind of checks out on every, like, every kind of aspect of the model, right? So we talked about, we talked about, like, tibia, um, the tibia angle, right? Yeah. And, like, his, like, his feet actually pretty turned out yeah right like more than most people yeah but actually i would say that his feet are not as turned out as his as his knees and his hips yeah so you're saying it's still but relative actually, relative if, if you look at his feet they might be like this but if you look at his knees his knees are actually like this so so it has this kind of cross cross angle that allows him Imagine this, you're looking at it from the bottom, right? It still allows him to kind of get his, so this is his tibia. It still allows his, his tibia to do this, right? So if we look at his pull, right? So, so this is the angle of his, um, of his knee, right? Kind of the, the bony peak is here. Yeah, and it's and a lot the, more abducted out, like you said, yeah, relative to his tibia. To, yeah, it's relative. Compared to, to his foot, right? So obviously he's he's got good like hip mobility, blah blah blah. And then he's not he's pulling the slack first, right? And he's not yanking at it in a way in which is like you said, pinball, right? Um, so this is the other thing. People think a slack pull is like um like a full-on pull and then like kick with the legs, right? But actually it's really interesting how he does it because he actually has two distinct um slack pulls, right? So Obviously, that 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 is the rep done, but let's replay that video. So if you see, that's so. When his hips are high, the a little bit of slack comes out of the bar. Right. Yeah. There we go. That's the yeah. first slack pull. Mm -hmm. That's the slack pull that gets him in the position. Right. Gets him that extension. Blah blah blah. And then once once he's in position, there's his second slack yeah. pull. So I think that's the uh, that's the other thing as well. Like you don't see on a stiff bar, but actually there's actually two distinct slack pulls, um, and and I think that's actually another thing that is probably really interesting about, I guess the model of the sumo deadlift, right? Because when you try to, like essentially the first movement is compressing into the bar, yeah, right. But some people pull so hard that the bar actually expands them. Right to the point in which they they just yank, and then the the entire back kind of like um, like flexes out. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I've never seen that to be honest. Um, you know, that that is interesting for sure. Especially what you said about that relative. It's still like distal femur ER, but it's relative. You know, tibial yeah. IR, which is what you need for internal rotation. Yeah, yeah. I, for sure. And I, I think like one person I want to like look at is like. Um, what do you think about what do you think about um, pugs um, deadlift? Because the way I look at it is obviously he's a great deadlifter, but you can see when he just starts off, it's already in. Because the moment yeah. he starts off, it's I mean it's still relative. You can kind of see already his whole foot is almost er'd out relatively. I mean he's a great deadlifter, right? Yeah. But I don't know what you would think about like you know elite athletes will always have elite conversations, but would you say? Yeah. If he add up to this foot angle just a bit, it'll be better because, you know, I'm looking at his, you know, his femur angle, um, where his femur is pointing at and the tibia is, you know, I think it is more out, but um, I don't know what you think, because I mean, 
like you said, elite lifters will always have elite conversations. I I, I still think that um it checks out though, because so? yeah. because if you um I I don't think it's good to draw it from when the from when the bar is obviously pulled because yeah, your yeah, hip, is, yeah. hip has already gone through internal rotation. Yeah. But from that position, right, when he's in position, if I were to put a line there and put a line there, right? Let me have a look at I would still say that the knees are a little bit further out in mm -hmm. terms of the of the amount of like the the, the feet are are like abducted. But the yeah. hips are actually even further, uh, even more abducted. Yeah, yeah. And I also think that another thing um, that is interesting with Pug's deadlift is that obviously we he he's a big proponent of having that um, a little bit of thoracic flexion. Mm. So that's a, that's another kind of factor that you probably need to put into the mix as well, right? Because um at some point if you don't have movement somewhere else that movement needs to come from another place yeah right? and and i don't know about you personally yeah but i i feel like pug might be okay let, let me look at his ig I, I don't know if you 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 check like isas and stuff yeah 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 your guys yeah man this is this is kind of gay but like i'm trying to look for a picture where he's shirtless so i can see look at his like isa i'm pretty sure he's in narrow i mean it's difficult to tell but i always assume most people are narrows yeah i, like, I always assume most asians are narrow i always assume most asians are narrows and if they're under 95 kilos i assume they're narrow yeah <laughs> so so that's one of one of the things as well right like Versus someone like a Yuri who 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 is it's obviously big. wide, yeah. And and like, I I also wonder if he's wide by like, by training or he's wide, like he's like wide because yeah of yeah, yeah, yeah yeah one wide. So, so that's another thing that you probably need to kind of factor into into um like movement strategy. So I mean, albeit as small, but um. I, I wouldn't be um like I wouldn't be surprised if Yuri is like a is like a wide and, and just just also looking at the hips and stuff. I'm pretty sure like he has a like wide top and like a wide IPA as well. Yeah. If 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 I if I were to take a guess, right? Yeah. Or he's just gotten so good at like um compressing like his skeleton. Shit out himself, well. Yeah. Yeah. So to to a point where he's actually, you know. Just, I can't really just, find a photo of Pug. I'm pretty sure it's there. Yeah, I, 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 I can't find I can't find one as well. But but I think that's also one of the things that might I think it's. Um, I mean, you 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 can always out train your structure. Uh, that's something I believe. Yeah. Um, but I I, if I had to guess, I would say that 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 is a contributing factor as well. But um. Yeah, so your hypothesis is like, okay, Ricky's narrow, he's more prone to maybe adduction, flexion, and so on and so forth. So you think that as a result makes him better at what he's currently leveraging in the sense that he can adduct more. Mm. So um, is that what you're saying? <clears throat> no, I, so 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 what 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 was your issue with, with Ricky's deadlift again? Well, I don't really have much of an issue, but it's more like I was thinking, what do you think about his, because um, <clears throat> I know what you said about Yuri saying, okay, he's got a massive, you know, really wide foot angle. He's got a really, but he's got an even wider knee sense and he's got a really, you know, everything's, the tibia is still relatively IR, right? But when I look at Pug's Delif, uh, you know, obviously great Delif once again, but he's starting his foot, like you said, in relative ER, but you're saying his hip is just an even more relative ER. Right. So you're just saying as a result, we could look at it, you know, we could flip it either way. This relative IR of a split. Is that what, basically what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I would say that um, Ricky is probably someone that is um, like he's, I, I would say that in my, in my opinion, 
Mm. I would say that Ricky still fits in the model of what I'm describing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, uh, yeah, I got so, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, might have, I might have a, a better example of someone that I think kind of doesn't fit this bill. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lift. Okay. So this is Tian. So let's. So this is an extreme example. Okay. Yeah, I can see, see how mm. that, that fits versus mm -hmm. how much. Um, so this is, I would say this is the foot is kind of, I would say this is like an expanded kind of position. Yeah. Just to use the terminology. And I would say that this, this knee angle is probably, so we need to get him in position first. So I would say that this knee angle is probably a little inside of that uh, yeah. foot angle. Yeah, for sure. Like only so, margin of like five, five, ten degrees. Yeah. So I my, this is my opinion again, right? Is that he makes up for it. Let's see if we can get a side view. Uh, I think I think Tian will probably will probably watch this video later on or something of us and and yeah. But if we can so, so the, the most, in, like how I notice it, right? Let, let's look at a barefoot because I think barefoot is always really interesting, like in terms of just being able to see that, that foot go through, that foot go through pronation, right? So that is pronation. People think it's like pronation is this like, like huge movement, but it's just actually- relative, like, yeah. It's a very small movement, right? But I think what how he makes up for it, right, is just having like long arms. So that so that's why I I I I would say that um, it'd be it'd be helpful to see it from the side because when you see it from the side, it makes sense. Like um, like we know that it's a it's a space, right? Like we know that the 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 ERIR whatever is a field, right? It's not like just an arc, right? Um, he probably is at the range in which he's like just within his his like ability to IR and because of like his genetics will put him in such a like it puts him in such a well leveraged position that he just needs to kind of um, start to compress from there right yeah so 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 I think the best example is when you watch him kind of miss that rep. You, you, you can you can see where the like expansion is happening. Yeah, can right. you play that one more time? Yeah. Yeah. So I just leave, let it run. Yeah. So the first one is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Right. Second one's pretty good as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 I would say that as the so if we're just using the model, I would say that at the peaks, that field probably like got smaller and smaller and smaller, and then he can't recapture that ER at the top anymore. Yeah. Right. And then it's just like, it's just like, okay, I can't, I can't, form, yeah. I can't resupinate, right? Yeah. Be because that foot, like if we look, look at the first rep. It's already, yeah. Like it's resup it resupinates, right? At mm -hmm. the top. It resupinates, boom, and then the third one, like you just see it, it just it's just like boom, I can't open anymore. So it's just like it's just locked in that position. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So so obviously he's a like he's like what 60, 68 kilos, and he's pulling like two four. Crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> but yeah. So 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 yeah, I, I think these are these are like really interesting um, bits about about people's um, like technique and stuff. So I would say that Tian is someone that probably doesn't fit, probably doesn't fit um, the visual model if you were just like looking at feet and knee angles. For sure. But I, I would say that um, like you keep, like obviously people are different. Yeah. So you could, you could fit them in like, this is where the individual kind of differences would, 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 would kind of happen, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Would you say like, so like, 
you know, when you when you coach, when you think about the technical model of the student with other, like how wide, um, once again, it's all up to the individual, but when you're looking at from a meticulous point of view, how, how would you look at it based? So let's say, for example, you have a new lifter mm. and you're like, okay, let's determine your stance width. How would you go about through identifying what would be best for the lifter? Because obviously it's dependent on their app, their ability to, like you said, enter into that abduct, abducted state at the start and then press off. But what, what, what would you kind of be thinking as your initial initial thought process? Mm. So I, I think if, if you're talking about practical coaching, the first thing I would say is like, if, if, I've, if it's just someone totally new, yeah, um, I would say, I will coach, the first thing I will coach is, I will coach them the stack, like really well. Yeah. Right? Because I think you don't have, like if you don't even stack, you don't have a lot of relative motions like available to you. Yeah. And even worse if you're someone that is already, um, even worse if you're someone that's already very restricted to begin with. Mm-hmm. Right? So I used to think that I was, I had no ER. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, if you put me on the table and you tested me, I don't have any IR, right? But but in the past, I would dump my whole pelvis into a big like anterior tilt, mm. and because of that, my knees would come in as well. So I couldn't open up my hips to get myself in a good position, yeah. right? So the first thing that I would cue for most people is when they're upright to have that small kind of posterior tilt. Yeah. Because that would open, that would kind of like be, first of all, um, have them have a little bit of glute max going so that they can create that externally rotated position to begin with. Yeah. Right. So that's the first thing. And then obviously you get abs, you get a little bit of like, you know, you get like expansion, you get like all that kind of stuff bracing wise. Right. So that's my first thing I would coach someone. But in terms of determining stance width, I would say that from the front and from the, um, from the front and from the sides, the important thing is that can they kind of like squat to the bar in terms of like if they, if, if like this is, this was their kind of like torso, can they kind of, and this was the bar, can they just kind of drop? So basically, can they flex their hip as much as they can and bend their knees as much as they can? Yeah. Right. So they've got, they've, they've got all these positions set already. Can they just kind of like, squat to the bar obviously you don't want to squat it and obviously for some people if their arms are long enough they will get to the bar right so these are people that are probably really you know are probably in a really good position to just pull from there and someone that comes to mind is obviously someone like someone like clinton right he can just like oh yeah just squat to the bar like he doesn't even need to like hinge like he doesn't even need to initiate a hinge to get to the bar Mm-hmm. Just like, um, let's see if we can find a good picture. Um, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, when you do that, right? Um, you, when you do that, you don't preload into your hamstrings and glutes as well, which is something I think he he um he he found out a lot a lot later on in just like developing his own like idea of the sumo deadlift that he needs to actually move his hips back, back in space. Um. Uh, which I think he learned from the Vietnamese in terms of just setting up and like like hinging, setting that hinge path, um, position a little bit better. But um, yeah, so that's what I would do. I would get them to kind of squat down, right? And for some people, like for myself, for, exa- for example, my the like I would get my like um, like my middle finger to the bar, and I know that okay, I I'm in a good like um, like profile view of like, what a good like shoulder positions, right? So I'm I'm literally kind of like just like squatting to the bar first, right? And yep. then I'll hinge, I'll hinge so that I can I can preload in the glutes and hamstring, mm-hmm. and then grab the bar as well without yeah. my shoulder um, coming forward of the bar. Yeah. So in order for that to happen, my shins need to leave the bar and my shoulders need to drop. So my hips need to kind of go back and do this. Yeah. Um, well, what about what about for yourself? Like, what what is so obviously that's that's quite um like technical. But 
um, in terms of doing a movement. But if you ask me to summarize it, I would say that I would like them to um, be able to uh, preload, like stack, stack all the joints ideally, yeah. and then preload and sort of set, set that hinge. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think mine would be something similar. Like, um, like you said, like, first of all, if you can't stack, then you're not gonna be able to lock out or, or whatnot in the first place. And, you know, these will come in and so forth, so on and so forth. So first of all, like, you know, we talk about, you know, like you said, exhaling into an inhale position, you know, get, get a nice, you know, get, 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 get a nice brace, get a nice stack, understand what that's like, you know, we could do some drills or whatever to get them to understand what it feels like, you know, just get the sense of awareness. And then, like you said, um, try to keep the stacks, uh, try to keep the joint stack. And then instead of abducting outwards, like you said, squat down and then just try to drive the knees like a pivot to, in, into the barbell. And I think one person that does it really well is my friend um, at my gym who pulled like 302, like 74, like recently. And I think this is, I'm going to share my screen because I think this is what he does extremely well. So let me see if I can share this. Okay, screen one. Can you see this? Yep. Okay, so let's get 235. Let's get something heavier. Um, But you can see, like, I mean, this guy's got great leverages, right? But like, the way he explains how he deadlifts is, <laughs> is, is he just simply tries to bring his knees forward. But let me see if I can get a front angle of him. Let's see. Oh. Maybe it's this one. But I think, yeah. If you look at his stance, And it fits, like I said, it fits your model, right? Like feet is like 10, five degrees left, but all he does is just kind of, he doesn't ER out. It starts off relatively already, you know, he's got, he's got great pin mobility, so on and so forth, but all he does is just goes forward and he pivots in from the side. Yeah. And then you can see here, just an easy lockout as a result. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know if this is the best video, but. Yeah. So, so, so I think this is the thing as well that we, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think this is the thing as well with um, with uh, with I would say that lifters who are not as well leveraged, yeah, like is that they tend to confuse um. They tend to pivot. Scoop. Yeah, they tend to pivot rather than um because they want it because if you look at dennis's position yeah. right yeah. shoulders are kind of like inside of his quads yeah. and his knee kind of like forward of the shoulder right um but if we look at if we look at if we're talking about um someone that is not as well leveraged right they would just like try to get that position by like dropping the hips and then like yeah. turn, turning right so what you will see is that, and I like to, I call this I, I call this cue like a shoulder pivot, right? Um, is that you need to move around your shoulder. Your shoulder shouldn't move, right? So if you want to move, right? Like if this is the straight line down from the from the bar, right? You and you, like this is your arm, right? Your hips need to move around this angle, yeah. right? You should not. What you should not be doing is. You should not be setting up like forward. So this is your arm. And then mm. you like try to rock back in the position because when when you don't move like this, the man, this is your torso, right? Mm. When you don't move like this and you move like this, right? Now, now you're just gonna drop the hip like really low. Yeah. And yeah. and then and then obviously everyone's like, oh, it's it, like it looks like a really good position. My hips are really close, my arms are like inside of my quads, but it's like, but it's like, yes, you don't. Like that looks like a good position because but it's actually a really poor position, right? Because what happens is you've increased knee and hip flexion. Right. And and like this is the analogy that I always tell people. Is it easier to half like leg press like like 500 kilos, or is it harder to like full leg press of like 500 kilos? Yeah. Yeah. 
like it's easier to half leg press something, right? So like the less um like the less amount of hip flexion and knee flexion that you go through in a sumo deadlift, the better it is because then it just makes it just means that you're leg pressing less weight off the floor. Like you can leg press more weight of the floor with less effort, right? Because now you, now your hips are high and your knee is not bad. Yeah. Like you are half squatting the weight off the floor. I right? think one yeah. of the problems is like they also like sorry. They like push you yeah. when they, you do that, like you're going to shift your weight onto your heels, but yeah. when you're pivoting back and if they don't re-counterbalance forward, like you said, well, okay, first of all, it's not going to come off because it's just, yeah. your hips are going to rise. But second of all, it's like exactly what you said, right? It's just that full leg press and your hips have to rise and you've just wasted four seconds of your life, you know, yeah. trying to get into that position. Yeah. So, so, um, so this is, I mean, Honestly, I don't want to. So, so, so this is him doing. <laughs> like, can you see how his shoulder, right? Like, obviously, yeah. he's got good as well. His shoulder yeah. doesn't like really roll back, right? No. It's still like his arms are not like straight to the floor as well. But, but I, I don't really want to use him as a bad example. But, like, I think he had, he has. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Atwood, how are we going to upload this, dude? <laughs> I, I I can't believe like I have to use him as a bad example, right? Uh, but like, but like he like in the end he gets there, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like this is one of the things, right? Like he he has this like he has this like lat engagement and then like that that pull as well. But man, I mean he, he pulls like he pulls, pulls insane. So, pulls so, way so, too much. <laughs> so just, like, like how like I like. Hey, this is a good example of that. Sometimes the model doesn't necessarily have to apply to everyone, right? Like, it's, but you know, that's a good example to always um, tell people because. And, and if if I look at that video, I don't even think his like his like feed angle and stuff like match what I'm talking about. Oh no, it does. It does. It, it does. Yeah. Fair so enough. so his, his everything else is pretty good, but yeah. but, um, I mean. It's gotten better, I would say. He's definitely like gotten much better at it. Um, I mean, there's one really interesting bit that I, I want to kind of. I just noticed, anyways, since we're talking about it, is yeah, uh, is is actually look at his shoulders. So um, this is and I guess another part of the deadlift that is a little bit more upper body, um, that I. I think uh, gets misunderstood a lot as well. Um, I'm not sure if you've considered this, but, and it's actually okay when you pull mixed. When you pull okay. mixed grip, it's, it's the one, problems only start when you start to pull hook grip, right? So look at how he engages the lap, right? And as he goes to pull, look at that shoulder going into internal rotation, right? Yeah. Right. So that's it. Yeah. If, yeah. So 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 um, this is a really interesting bit. Is that I think one of the reasons why some lifters like miss on grip, um, especially if they pull hook, is they think that they need to overly engage their like, um, their lats. Right. So what they do is imagine this is your hook grip. Right. You've hooked really well, and then as you go into position, you start to do this. Because you think lat engagement, right? You think like squeeze the like yeah. orange in your armpit. Yeah. So what happens is your arms start to like do this, right? And if you have a bar, you're you are literally using your lats to undo your hook grip. Like your hook is like this, right? And then you just squeeze like it's like you use your lats to like count like open up your hands like this. And, and I think a lot of people, when they, when they start, when the weight starts to get really heavy, they're like, I'm going to squeeze my lats really, really, really hard. And then next thing they know, they're at lockout and they're like, I need to squeeze, 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 squeeze. And it's like, I don't understand why I keep losing your grip. It's because they overdo that lat engagement. Yeah. Right. And I think this is, this is one of the things that applies for not just, uh, not just uh, sumo pullers. I think um, it applies to kind of uh, conventional pullers as well. Yeah. And I think the easiest way I explain it, uh, in addition to what you said, right, 
if you're squeezing your lats, what's going to happen is your shoulder is going to, you're going to basically increase your range of motion, right? Because you've gone from tugging it at the perfect point. And like I said, if you lose the hook grip, you basically, first of all, ruin your starting position because now your shoulder and your armpit is moving relatively back, which means you're going to be starting slightly further behind when theoretically, if you were just at that point, and that was a perfect starting point, now you've got to readjust slightly. But like you yeah. said, the range of motion increases as well, and it also messes with the grip. So you basically just lose on, well, first of all, you're going to get weaker because you're going to have to pull, you know, like 0.1 centimeter more, but you're also going to miss out on grip, like you said. So, you know, best way. I think Chance Mitchell also said something similar. It's like, the more tension you put in somewhere, you know, it's a zero sum game, right? So the more you put into your grip, well, the less you're going to be able to focus on putting it elsewhere. And, yeah. you know, we're not pulling it with our fingers, we're pushing it with our claws. So, you know, you're totally agree with what you said. Yep. Yeah, man, that's that's like another just interesting bit of um of a, of a, yeah, deadlift things, at least for the upper body. So, yeah. so one thing I am um, kind of curious about in terms of for you is, do you do any sort of, um, do you just do any sort of like prep and stuff for your deadlifters? Just for, like sumo. For sumo? Um, yes. Or even conventional actually. Just for conventional, sumo. the only thing I do is I get them to squeeze a yoga block in between your knees when they're starting to um, just doing like 60 or like, uh, like a one blue or two blues or, you know, one red or two reds because that just helps them feel a bit more of that internal internal rotation and the actors just fit more just to get them to, you know, especially for someone who doesn't understand the concept. I think that's just super useful, but like, like the goal of warming up, right. Is to get you ready for SPD. So, you know, it really depends on what kind of movement capacity you have. Like if I were to prescribe, you know, positional drills or, you know, whatever we want to call them, like I only do like two sets of like two exercises each, but it's really context dependent, but nothing specifically for the deadlift in itself. Um, but really just the only thing I would do is the, uh, block, the block squeeze. Um, so, yeah. So, so I'm a little bit curious about that. Um, just because you, you have like, um, um, you know, uh, Alex's stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a little bit just confused. I would say, sure. Does the, does the, does the block feed internal rotation or, or I mean it feeds internal rotation for sure but like does it what happens at the at the pelvis like like it closes it yeah yeah, yeah. so so if I were to do like say uh heels elevated squat with a block between my knees does that change the the pelvis as it goes through like different degrees of hip flexion that would bias more. So like, there's like two variations we see with like the respiratory goblet squat, right? The bandit and the, the one, the, the one with the block. So I've asked Alex personally this question. Basically the question is, are we biasing more mid late? You know, are we biasing that mid to late stance of things? Or are we biasing early to mid? So when we're trying to decipher which one to use, the band is gonna promote more this early to mid um, phase of gait mechanics because we're not trying to compress which, which is what we think is more of a mid late thing. So he would give it to people like wides or people who are people of an anterior orientation that might be narrows or just people who are, you know, not true narrows, right? Without any other con under conversations. We would give the block to uh, people who are true narrows. So for example, like me, we would give that because we would want to bias more relative, you know, true internal rotation through the pelvis. And how you would be able to achieve, like you said, what, what, what can we get through the pelvis? Because what happens in like the squat is like at the top, Alex calls it like toe off, you know, at the top it's toe off, going down um, IR, you know, so, and then at the bottom it's yielding. So max heel strike and a max propulsion. So, the, so how we would buy some more change in the pelvis is, you know, if we create that feedback loop with the block and also add the breathing element like exhalation, then that would help get more theoretically, you know, internal rotation through the pelvis. But whether you put it through the block or the band, you're going to be, get, the way I look at it is you're going to be getting more of it, getting more of 
IR and ER, you know, relative IR and ER, just for the sake of doing it. But adding whether the ban, adding rather adding the ban or the block is going to increase the additional focus on whether you want to buy some more internal rotation. And if we were trying to think about what to queue, we would squeeze the block um, coming down and coming up, only pass from zero to ninety, and then we just like like let it loose and then come up, squeeze it, squeeze it coming up. But I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, so 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 it, it does, and it leads me to like a question about the deadlift, right? Okay. And I think that that's um this is what the discussion is for. Like, so so I don't know if you, I think at least you probably will have experienced this, just because we work with a predominantly like Asian population. Um, it's like the flower pelvis. I don't, I, like the, the pelvis is just open. Yeah, I wish I brought my pelvis model back. I have it. I have it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like it's like it's like this is a closed pelvis, right? And this is an open pelvis. Yeah. So I would say like um, counter mutated sacrum and like like opened up, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. loads of time. So I I have lifters who like deadlift, right? And they when you visually look at them, they don't have the kind of like they don't have that mutated position. Yeah. Does, does that make sense to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So they're just very like, they're just very open. And yeah. They're, yeah. yeah. Um, they can ER and all that, but it's, it's I don't even think it's like real ER. It's just Are you like, talking about specifically in the deadlift at the starting point for a sumo deadlift or yeah. for a sumo yeah. deadlift? Okay. Um, actually, both, both. Okay, conventional. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Convention as well. It's just like when you look at it, you're like, okay, like something about that deadlift, right? Doesn't look right just because, like the the lumbar is very flat, like very flat, and they don't have this like, they don't have that like, like alternating like S curve. Yeah, slight extension that um, yeah. thoracic yeah. upwards. Yeah, cut on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's very flat, and then they have like this, they have that thoracic like curve, but then after that, it's just like flat whereas like if you look at like someone like dennis for example right you can see that it is flat and it has that curve and like it's it's really nice but then there is that like there is that like um uh kind of like kyphotic like glute kind of space yeah let me just share it one more time you're talking about basically here there's a slight bit of extension here right but you're saying like but yeah. you're saying yeah. most of your lifters usually it's like it's just a straight line going through here, rather than a slight extension through here. This is normal. This is what we want to see anyway. But you're saying here, most of the lifters you have straight line, but it's not, you know, ex slightly extended like you would see in this. Yeah, it's almost like it's not extended. Or, or no, it's almost as if it's fully extended. For your lifters, or you mean for Dennis? No, uh, um, for 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 my lifters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it's the hips fully extended already. So mm -hmm. the glute like fully concentric. Mm -hmm. There is no look into it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For my lifters, so, I don't really I mean I think I think the difference between my lifters and your lifters is most of my lifters are still in that beginner stage where I'm still te teaching them how to delve much better. So I know you've got a lot more experienced lifters. So you know I, I can't really comment too much, but most of my lifters right now what they struggle with the most is just using a rectus abdominis strategy really to kind of crunch down into the weight. Um, so, I mean, this, I think this is even more applicable towards sumo than it is with conventional because a lot of people use a rectus abdominis strategy in a sumo deadlift and, you know, like for the people who may be watching, it's like, what is that? Well, really it's like an inability to first of all, find a stack and using your obliques. Right. And then when they, do, this is, I think this is the main problem is that they probably are doing that, what you call the pivoting to the point where they want to do a hip pump and pivot to the point and use the six pack yeah. to kind of crunch them into position, right? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, to answer your question, I haven't really noticed whether my lifters are super, super counter mutated, um, to be completely honest. Do you have an example of your own lifter? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I could be, and I also could be, um, I could be off with this um with this uh, assessment as well and you might see something different for okay. me so um, look. yeah so 
deletion screen is good that there is such a site. Yeah. Right. So so I'm not sure if you can kind of tell like what I'm looking at. So you're saying like near the tailbone, like you're saying that's just fully. Yep, yep, yep. Fully, yeah. You know, like it's fully like flexioned almost in. as if yeah. it's yeah. almost like flexioned in. Yeah. Right? And, like, and like just looking at his like he's someone that I don't think can 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 IR that pelvis, can close that like inlet. Mm -hmm. Right. So we just look at his squats. I know like I mean. I'm sorry, I have to throw him under the bus like that. It's all good. I'm sure he will enjoy it. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm trying to help him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I can see for sure. You can see, like, he, he like, has to hinge into a squat, right? Like, it's, so I don't think he has any ER or IR. Like, around, like, 60 degrees, like, he just kind of hinges into a squat, right? Yeah. And you can see his center of gravity is just all over the place. I think this guy has a bit of a rectus abdominis strategy as well. Just looking at his mid, yeah, like around his belt, right? Like he's crunching in. And that's actually another thing is that I noticed a lot of people use the SPD belt. I'm not sure if it's the belt's problem where it's too thick or like whatnot, but I think people who have the SPD belt have a lot more trouble with this rectus abdominis strategy. I, I like, I don't know. Maybe it's just a bias that I see. You know, obviously there's great lifters who. Yep. Is SP developed, but I hear a lot of rib problems and so on and so forth. Yeah. Oh. No, no, that's no, there's no reason to look at his bench. I don't think. <laughs> the only reason I would say that his bench is like, like, like this is the thing as well. Like looking at models and thinking about models, it's like the movement is the movement is the movement, right? Like, like it doesn't matter like what the expression is. For sure. Like, if you if you see it in a squat, it's most likely gonna happen in a in a in a, I mean, like in a power lift, at least you see in a squat, it's gonna happen in the in the in the um, deadlift as well. Deadlift as well, and I think you might actually be right about the rectal strategy, because if we look at his bench, right, like look at the, what that elbow that look at that shoulder position, what that what that thing is doing. I suspect, right. I just think he has nothing everywhere. Um, yeah, he. I think he has like, and the thing, the thing about him is like, this is something I'll give, I'll give, I'll give him is that he's extremely good at like, just like holding position and grinding through shit. And it's not like, it's not bad, right? Um, because he does get the lift, but it's bad in the sense it's like, it's, it's like, I don't it creates know. a false expectation. Like, yes, I get, exactly. it creates a false expectation for the left. You're saying, "Oh, I can do this," but really, it's more like you are an exceptional person at executing yeah. something that you should not be able to execute in, in a way. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if he posted it, but um, I just think, yeah, from what I can see from this guy, like, I just think he doesn't really have much of anything, any ER yeah. or IR, and. I mean, great. He compensates really well. And like I said, powerlifters are going to compress inevitably, right? But this is why, like, when I work with a lot of the people that's just joined me recently, it's like, okay, my job as a coach is to spend the least amount of time generating the most amount of results. Yeah. I believe restoring relative level of movement capacity is going to be more beneficial than me spending 60 minutes trying to fix your squat or deadlift per se. Because yeah. really, it's me finding a, your body a movement strategy and getting restoring hip flexion and shoulder flexion and straight leg raise to bring you from someone in a severe or a, you know relative level of anterior orientation to bring you back. And yeah, yeah I think that's one of the problems of, you know, well, one of the difficulties with online coaching, which is, you know, kind of your main thing, right? Um, is like doing these assessments and doing all these like things is, well, first of all, it's very time inefficient and really, you know, you have to charge a lot more to get out of it. But it's also yeah. more difficult to communicate or explain to a lifter, right? Like, you know, guys like, hey, JJ, I want to get strong. And then you're like, hey, man, let's put you sideline and let's give you a 35 degree reach. And can we have that right foot adapted in and feel your medial arch and big toe? Like, he's yeah. like, what the, what the hell did I just get into? Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but that's why I think, you know, um, that's probably one of the most difficult things. That's what you do is like, how do you, you know, finding the balance of trying to, 
instill these more long-term changes and yep. you know what you can do with your actual time you know you've got you know a little, dozens and dozens of lifters and it's just not possible for you to get the same treatment to every single one right yep. so but yeah i think uh, but, like that guy yeah no but i also think that um oh man i want to find it at like a like a like a video of him just eating like just full yeet his squat man like you'll see like You'll see, like I, 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 like I look at it and I'm like, you literally have no, like, movement capacity, but you're just getting the freaking shit done by just squeezing so bloody hard. Hey, man, like, that's good shit. It, it's yeah. impressive, but like, as a coach, I'm, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't think it's it's, um, I don't want to say it's unsafe. I would say it's not sustainable. Like, we'll yeah. be we're, we're, like. Um, like I don't know how an end game looks like, but I will probably say that like he is probably pretty end game. If, yeah. If, if I ever had, he's close to end game. He's close. To end yeah. Game. He's close. To like, um, so 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 I guess like this is like um, you know, my kind of my kind of like issue to deal with, but but because you're you're I would say that you're more you've learned more of the model. I've just kind of like pieced it. Yeah. Like, oh, but like, what, 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 what? How would you like address someone that's pretty angry? I, I think he's okay. narrow. Narrow. Like, okay. Not so far. yeah. First of all, we have to define what an end game is. So th there's multiple ways of. So real end game is somebody with a sway back posture, with a rectus abdominis strategy to hold him back. Because a narrow. Let's start with what a narrow is. A narrow is somebody who is counter mutated bias and external rotation, abduction, flexion, right? They're good at squatting, they're bad at deadlifting because they get external rotation, not good at internal rotation. Now, what kind of happens to people who might not be true narrows anymore and go into conversation is the first layer is they go into anterior orientation because they're trying to find internal rotation, but they can't. And in order for you to lift, you need to find internal rotation and the body doesn't care how you do so, right? So what's gonna happen is if it's not coming from your knees, it's not coming from your foot, because it's not coming through the pelvis, and it's going to come through an extension through the TL junction, okay, mm -hmm. which is right above <clears throat> the pelvis. So you have this sagittal orientation pushing through, um, pushing you through into extension, and then an end game is when you're so far, and so your center grab is so far forward, you crunch your rectus abdominis to come back. So first of all, how will we treat the end game? We have to put the person into a sideline position. Because as a narrow, theoretically, you know, um, you could say, okay, well, a true narrow, you just put them prone. But because this one's, this, the ISA doesn't matter anymore. Once you're in endgame, the ISA doesn't matter anymore. So you just put them in sideline because you need to give them, you know, A to P expansion. You need to give them front to back expansion. So one thing that we really, uh, you know, is really great is um, what I call a TFL decompressor. I've learned this from Alex Seffer. So, what it is, is pretend this is a foam roller. You literally put the person's sideline onto the TFL. And the reason why is a TFL is a compensatory internal rotator. So people who can't access true internal rotation through the pelvis will use a TFL leverage as internal rotator. So if you put them sideline in that position, they're going to say, oh, this hurts really, really bad. Okay. So first of all, we're eccentrically orientating the TFL, which is going to probably help them hang that yada, yada, yada. But Putting sideline and crushing their pelvis on that side is going to give them, you know, relative adduction through the pelvis. So that's what we do. And then you reassess. So maybe this person, if it's an end game, probably has nothing. So no straight leg raise, no, no hip flexion. Let's say sub 60 for hip flexion, sub 30 for straight leg raise, right? And then that should restore them or raise some levels of internal rotation. Then, um, you know, you, then you can see, okay, are they someone who has a lateral orientation or they have a, you know, left pelvic upslip or they have a left hip hike and they shift to the left? If so, then they need to find a right glute and something like that would be, um, you could, there's a load of exercises. It could be like a high to low cable press where you're pushing from right to left. It could be something called a sideline strider. So you go sideline, sideline in, which is good. And then you just press against the wall through your medial arch, through your ball big toe. That could be something. And then, like I said, really, like, I think the most important thing I learned from, like, um, Alex Seffer's mentorship is, like, the exercises don't really matter. It's the principles that really matter, right? Like, 
I can memorize main exercises, but that wouldn't make me a good, you know, a good application of the principles because I need to know what's going on. So the end game, the immediate goal is to turn off the rectus, put them on the side, get them to feel the external obliques and internal obliques. That's the first thing. That's what I would do. So for that lifter that you have, put them on the side, get, give them the TFL, TFL decompressor because that's the most brainless thing and this guy probably won't be too overwhelmed by it. And then yeah. think, do they still need more sideline stuff? If not, they need to find their hamstrings, right? Because the hamstrings is going to help them posteriorly um, pull, pull them back. Um, and that's something I would do. Let me show you. Let me show you how good this guy is at yeeting fucking deadlifts, bro. It's like, Wait, what? It's like, like, that's impressive, I'm like, man. I don't, I don't know how the fuck you're doing that, but like, he's just gonna like, he's gonna pull. He's gonna like, oh, fuck my back. Oh. Like, like it doesn't like his back doesn't look painful. I'm like his neck looks painful to me. Oh, his neck too, but oh, that yeah. initial pull, man. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. So 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 it's like, like I obviously um I don't want to give up on him, but um <laughs> it's like it's like he trains at your gym though. Yeah, he trains at gym. Yeah, he's at my gym. So I, I can I I've got time to work with him. It's just like um it's just that I think he needs to like. Um, uh, like I mean, just from a model, from perspective of a model, and thinking about deadlifts, it's like the reason he can't hinge is probably because he cannot create that no IR, yeah, that, that IR right, that shape change the pelvis, yeah. So, so that will affect like two things. Um, that will that, that will affect his deadlift for sure, and that will also affect his squat, unless he doesn't want to, unless he doesn't want to. You just want to dive bomb through the IR range. Well, unless he wants to, he wants to join a front squatting competition. <clears throat> um, even then, I don't even think that might be a good idea. But like, uh, yeah, he's not gonna be able to low bar because you need to hinge the low bar. Yeah. Like if it, I, yeah, I, I, I totally to understand that. Like that guy reminds me of, like you said, you need a hinge to internal rotate, right? Yeah. And that exactly is why I'm, I'm training my dad. And he has no straight leg raise. And that's exactly the thing that's fucked his back five times in a row because I keep trying to get him to try to hinge. And his back just rounds. I'm like, oh, fuck. And, and he just lays in bed the next day. But no, totally. Like, and that's like, that's one of the things. Like, you can try to teach him stacking or whatever as much as you want. But I think this is one of those cases where you have to restore that relative motion because he just yep. cannot, he cannot function without positional drills to kind of. So yeah, just put him sidelining and then see how straight leg race goes. I'm like, like, bro, can you breathe in your chest? And he's like, nope. And I'm like, the yeah, lungs in there, bro. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, how are you alive, man? Like, um, and the thing is, it's it's um, it's so interesting because I think now now we're talking about real practical examples, right? We we've, we've talked about the model, we've talked about like, yeah, shiny examples of the model, yeah, <laughs> like relative motions and yeah. like exceptions to the model and then i think like this is the application of, of things right um which is which is kind of like the fun bit and also the confusing bit is like i think uh like like you mentioned about your dad like putting a lot of um like strain on the back and stuff it's like like that body's gonna find internal rotation it's just whether it's gonna do it through through like an erector or or, exactly. or like, like exactly. a glute right? um like or, or or even better like you can see people with like huge calves and it's yeah. like yeah like like nice yeah. nice nice pair of glute maxes you got like yeah. right above ankles bro yeah <laughs> like pretty much pretty much dude. like yeah. you just look at their calves and you're like oh this guy's in late stance and yeah that's that's when you just know like yeah for sure and that's where i think like you know, when we see like a huge divide right now on Instagram where, you know, like half the people are shitting on kind of the positional drills and half the people are just like, you know, I, I think it's totally right, um, you know, to be skeptical. But, you know, like the way I always preach is like, well, guys, this is like not 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 your day to just do positional drills. I, I make it five minutes, you know, five minutes, two sets of each, six sets in total, you know, hit the platform. Because, you know, the way I say to them is like, you're not going to be fixed in a week. Otherwise, I think um, I might as well not do this job. 
Um, but you know, we're, we're going to make, you know, weekly improvements and that's really what, you know, we need to do. I think, you know, it's just, it's an interesting one. Like the, the real world example where we think about what to do with the deadlift or what to do with lifting. I, I get stuck half and half now, murder to yeah. when I have, when I have a new client, I think to myself, I really want to just do all his biomechanics assessment. No, no barbell work for like the first 60 minutes. Then I think to myself, okay, does this guy really want to listen to me talk for 55 minutes and like help him improve his squat straight like when he doesn't know what the fuck is going on, right? That's one of the things. I don't know what you do with your in-person assessments, but you know. So with my in-person, um, I give, like, I like the breathing stuff just because it's it's a, it's a free buy-in, I think. Yeah. Like, like, I think I've posted this on my Instagram stories before. Mm -hmm. Free buy-in, like, it's, it's, it's almost, it's like, I almost feel like I'm cheating people sometimes. Yeah. It's like someone comes to me and they're like, I have knee pain or, and I have like shoulder pain. I'm like, okay, let's, let's check your ER and IR, right? Like, and I don't, I don't check like flexion and I don't like, I, I mean, I can check it if I want to, mm -hmm. but I just think like, it's just so technical to check. Right. And um, like, and it's, and it's like, they can flare their ribs, they can do all that. So I just do I it. Think it's easier to, I think it's easier to cheat in ER and IR. Yeah. I think I think flexion is much easier. Yeah. Oh, you think you think flexion yeah. is much easier? Yeah. I think I think IR and ER is a little <laughs> easier. I just yeah. um, fair enough. And I don't know. Maybe maybe this is just like where I started from. Like, yeah. Um, and 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 just experience like what you use more. You obviously yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but the thing is, the way I use it is that if someone tells me they have like um shoulder pain or like shoulder discomfort i'm just gonna be like okay like let's check what you don't have like if do you not have ir or do you not have er right and then i just use very basic stuff like um okay like i want you to do a like a 90 90 or or we could do rock back breathing or we could do like it depends on what they need right like yeah. if they need if they need ir and i'll probably get you 90 90 if you not 90 90 sorry um like a like a all force because that's a 90 degree reach. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, I could do a low reach as well. Um, 90, with like 90, 90 with the, with the low reach. I can do a, like a rock back as well. I just like, I just literally pick a drill. I'm just like, dude, let's do a plank. Let's do it. Let's, let's just do a plank, right? Like yeah. it's basically an all fours anyways. Yeah. Like your shoulder is going to be there. And I'm just going to coach that exercise for like five minutes really well. Like make sure you breathe out and push your sternum like to the ceiling rather than like doing this, right? Just think about like retracting the rib cage, and then the next thing, and then I get them to recheck, right? And then like, oh my god, my shoulder feels better, and I'm like, yeah. okay, great, okay, great. Like I just met you in ten minutes, and you already think I'm like I'm like a magician, right? Yeah, yeah. And it makes the session easier, but For also sure. like get under the bar or like they go to bench press, like, like there is just so much value. I think at least, um, when a, when a, when a, when within the first like few minutes. The person working with you is like, oh my god, I like, my shoulders have never felt so good. And yeah, like, yeah, for sure. And it's like, and it's like, okay, like, like this person, like, is already sold. Like, I don't need to convince you. Like, at this point, I can just like build on that, right? But obviously, it's not, it's not, like, it's not a trick or anything because you still need to know, like, what you're expanding, what you're compressing, exactly. so on and so forth, right? Yeah. You still need some thought processes to it. Yeah. And then obviously, um, like hips and lower body things, I'm a little bit more, I'm not as practiced, I would say, like, mm -hmm. because I, um, with that kind of stuff, I usually do a few drills and then I try to adjust um, stances and, and ang toe angles and stuff like that, because I think it's a little bit more complicated to me. Like, I don't understand, like, like this is where my this is my limitation is because I don't understand like the different levels of compression because that's like mm. at the level of the trochanter and then so on and so forth. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Level yeah. Of and um, like, like so, like it's a little bit more complex to me. I, I know it's like the same system. Yeah. Like shoulder and 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 the hip, but um, yeah. So that's a, that's that's my kind of limitation. But but other than that, um. Yeah, get them do the drills, and I think the exercises are the are the are the big one, of course. Um, obviously, if there's like, if there's really someone that is in a lot of pain, 
or like it has a lot of issues, I just would throw up. <laughs> like yeah. it's it's like I'm there to be a powerlifting coach. I think I'm not there. To- yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I totally agree with you. On, in the sense, like it it's nice to create a buy-in. Um, but yeah, it, it does feel kind of interesting sometimes because you know we're just you know we're not people who are actually you know physios or you know TPTs or whatnot. So like, it's really a case of staying in our real house, in a sense. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Sure. Yeah. Um, what about what about um, like, I don't know if you 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 um do it much. How about like accessories and stuff like that? Oh yeah, yeah. So like, half the time is spent on accessories. So, you mean talking about sumo deadlift or like just in general? This for like. And yeah, yeah let's, let's, talk, let's, let's just keep it specific to like um, just deadlifting, I guess. Yeah, so, you know, obviously besides literally deadlifting, I mean, we're talking about tier two or tier three or whatever we call it, accessories. Um, it depends on what movement capacity you have. They've got greater than 90 degrees of head flexion. I would give them the Camperini deadlift, like the retro step single leg deadlift. Um, and you know, there's a lot of debate, you know, should we use a foam roller one? Should we use a retro step one? I prefer the retro step because it pulls your center gravity back a bit more um, versus having, you know, your front leg forward and you're the one hinging to that one. Um, the foam roller one does give you a bit more reference, like your feedback, because you're pressing the foam roller into your knee. So you get the aperture feedback. But if you're in person, I think you can coach it well enough. Um, so I'll do the Camperini because, um, first of all, it's a deadlift. It's a hinge, teaches people how to hinge properly and it just recruits internal rotators. Um, but aside from that, like I think the most important thing for a deadlift conventional is I would just, if there was a leg press, I would just literally just hammer it out. Um, but there isn't one in my gym, but I think leg press would be great. Um, but to be honest, there's not many machines in my gym uh, per se. So just like hamstring curls or like submissions. But I think Camperini is the main one. Um, I think you could do banded step downs as well. Banded step downs is quite good if you want to try to get, so you put the band around your knee, so, and then you just step down, then you feel that adductor and glute medius again. Right. If we're trying to buy some internal rotation, like I said, accessories is always about the intention, but if I'm trying to really hammer out maximum compression, maximum, you know, especially as a narrow, right? There's no point of me doing respiratory goblet squats or whatever. So I, I'm just like, okay, let's go. 90 degrees head flexion, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and just keep hammering it out. Like band of step downs, Camperini's. Those more, those would be my two main accessories if I had to do one. Um, toe elevates with squats um, would be one. I would, like I said, contralateral or ipsilateral depends on what the person needs. Um, contralateral, I would usually give to people who need more of a early to mid um, phase of gate. So this would probably apply to, you know, your guy. Um, mm. But I would definitely get him to be on the front foot elevated, um, toe elevated for squat, because that guy cannot use his feet, to be honest. So he needs to elevate his foot to unweigh himself. And then he needs to toe elevate, because a front foot elevated by itself is just early mid, but this guy probably can't even do that. So <laughs> I did give him toe elevated for squat. So yeah, toe elevated for squat's great. Um, you know, people like, might be like, oh, rear foot elevated. You know, you can train more of that mid to late, but I feel like as a powerlifter, like, mate, like, I, I need to be more, like, I need to do less. I need to do less of that shit. But this is the thing, right? Um, if, if I need you to do, like, more mid to late, why don't I just give you an extra set of deadlifts? Exactly. Yeah. Like, why don't I just give you, like, some other heavy accessory work that's just going to compress you further, right? Exactly. Like, I'm, um, like some people might want to do i i this okay i'm not against like rear foot elevator or bulgarians i'm just against like just like like wholesale application it's like everyone's doing like like mid and late propulsive activities and compressing themselves harder when sometimes like some people don't need to be compressed harder in their accessories like i think that's yeah like yeah you yeah you like get strong blah 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 but it's like you can also like you can also like mess people up quite bad right and i think 
like Tian is an example of that. He doesn't do like he used to do so much like um, RFEs that his knee would like just hurt, like and he like he like his squat would suffer. And I'm like, yeah, because you're like when he does an RFE, his feet literally does this. Like he has no heel, and I'm like, yeah, but like look at how good his deadlift is. Yeah. Like that man is like compressed. Like you don't need to compress him any further. Like exactly. yes, I get it. Train quads, go and train quads, but you don't need to. You don't need to like do more of that. No, but yeah, like okay, so like I guess staying on topic. I'm not because we've just gone off so many times. But um, would you ever use something like a more that's more like bilaterally compressive, like a like like a like a straight leg deadlift, like an RDL, or even like a dumbbell RDL, for example, that's just yeah, bilateral, or like sure. a trap, or something like that. Uh, I think trap bar is actually really good if you like for beginners who really need to learn. Assuming this is like a main accessory, not like you know, like accessory variation, not like yeah. you know, do it after you tell So I think drop bar is really good um, because um, for people who struggle with hinge, I think it's a great way to teach them one part of the lift, which is like pressing, and then in the meantime, you could give them internal rotation. Um, about the RDL and stuff, hmm, I'm not really sure. Uh, RDL isn't really something I put into people's program. Um, I, I know, you know, I think I read a story about you said you should give it for hyper, hypertrophy if they need it, but I think if I wanted to advise the hamstrings, I might just get them to do a seated hamstring curl or prone hamstring curl because I'm thinking to myself, okay, uh, I want to, first of all, hammer the shit out of someone and minimize the amount of technical um, yeah. inefficiencies. So I don't want to add more variation, right? The goal of any pelting athlete is to minimize the burn. So let's try to make these things as brainless as possible for the lifter. And I'll just literally have around hamstring curls. Second of all, um, I haven't programmed RDLs yet right now because a lot of the people with me are still, you know, not true narrows or not true wise. And I have to really kind of, you know, hold their hand and say, okay, you know, yeah, it's unilateral stuff like that. But, you know, maybe for example, later down the line, would I give them an RDL? I wouldn't say, like, I'm not blanketed. I'm not like, oh, I hate bilateral compressive exercises. I hate it. It's more like, um, do I think the lifter, if the lifter is psychologically aroused by it? Okay, fine. I'll give them, I'll give them like half and half. I'll give some bilateral, some non-bilateral. And if they say, oh, I want to do RDLs. Okay, fine. I'll give them RDLs and dumbbell RDLs in that, in that context. So, but if they're like, oh, I don't really care. Just make me strong. Then I'll be like, okay. Okay, machine work, you know, mm. and stuff like that, or cable work and stuff like that. Because, you know, I think you and I, we have, we have a similar line of thinking where, you know, we really want to drive high pressure free food accessories. But I'm thinking, you know, if someone's really strong, how heavy do I have to load this guy's RDL, right. you know, to really do that? And like from the time, time perspective as well, getting someone to load, I don't know, 140, 150 kilos in RDL, they got to warm up to it versus hit the hamstring curl machine or hit this machine or whatever. And then, you know, just do four sets in like 10 minutes. So, you know, I think, yes, from a theoretical standpoint, I'm not against bilateral compressive exercises, but from a practical standpoint as well, I have to think about time constraints yeah. and low limitations as well. Yeah. So that's my, that's my way of thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Because, because the, the, no, the reason I asked is because if you say that you, um, obviously the yeah I, I agree on the technical coaching aspect of it like like an RDL is actually like a heavy RDL is actually pretty um, like tough to get right and probably quite high risk as well if you want to put that in there but um, no because I'm just yeah I guess I'm what I'm interested is in is like could you not give them some IR by compressing them. I could. I can oh. even put the block in between their knees and get them to do it at the same time. Yeah. I think I could for sure. Like because like we know that like bilateral activities are probably like the one that you can use the most load on. So like by virtue of having the most load, you probably have a more compressed environment. Yeah. Right. 
and and I don't know because this is just one of my thoughts recently. It's like okay, if someone's actually lacking IR, are they just weak? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like I I just wonder sometimes, like just to poke holes in kind of the model and stuff. It's like. Maybe if you just got stronger, you would have all the like IR that you need. Um, I don't know. Um, you, you might get that IR through like compensation. Um, you might get that IR through like like orientation. Um, but rather than relative motion. Um, but I don't know. Like so. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, is it you're getting? Uh, like I don't know. Does I guess if I were to summarize, you just make someone stronger, and then they'll find their IR. Or, I or, think. Or, yeah, or, or I, I get your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think to answer your question, I think that getting someone stronger is going to inevitably allow, um, is going to inevitably make that person find compensatory strategies to internally rotate through orientations, through whatever. I think that's a fact because there's no way somebody can lift maximal weight without some form of compensation orientation, right? As powerlifters, we will always have an anterior orientation. That, that's not even the question. Like, great, my straight leg resists 80, my hip flexion is 130, you know, great, my shoulder flexion is full. Do I think I have an anterior orientation? Yes, <laughs> okay? Like, you know, that, that's, yeah. I, do I have a right oblique orientation? Yes, because there's no possible way as powerlifters, which is the goal is to lift the most maximum amount of weight. It's not possible for us to not compensate. So I think your, the answer to your question is, yes, they will find IR, but it's not the relative motion of IR that we're looking for. I think that's really the answer because most people, even without lifting weights, man, like even with lifting weights, like I, I look at my parents, that. like look at their feet. <laughs> like you would think oh my neck hurts like shit oh well, well wait i'm an anterior orientation you know look at your bunions on your feet like they are all just compressed like i've never seen i've never seen a single person with heel strike feet okay i've never seen a single person with heel strike feet I, i've never seen it so i'm very surprised when you know i went on connor's and alex's mentorship and they showed me that like, oh this is what a heel strike foot looks like i'm like okay i have no idea how you got there dude i i literally don't even know how you found this person because I've done so much IR work and my foot's just barely mid late, right? Like, you know, my pinky's still a bit averted. I'm like, you know, I, I think the answer to your question is, yeah, load is going to, like you said, more load, less reps, compressive strategy, high reps, um, less load is an expansion or yielding strategy, right? Blood work is expansion, so on and so forth. But that's not really the true type of IR because everybody, I think Bill Harvin said as well, like powerlifters will inevitably become flat yeah. like a pancake yeah yeah for sure unless you don't want to be a, unless you don't want to be a very good one yeah then unless, yes. unless you want to just front squat every day and then you know do a lot of the different shit yeah